Well, th thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, good morning. Thank for invitation. Why are you laughing? <laughs> no, it's a <laughs> very difficult language, uh, Norwegian. Uh, and I, I must say, we were just chatting a moment ago, that when I was a student, I don't know about the rest of you, I, I had Mao's Little Red Book. Did any of you have Mao's Little Red Book when you were a student? And I used to think that Mao was a kindly gentleman that wouldn't hurt a flea. But in, as you'll see in a moment, I no longer uh, share that view. But uh, so maybe some of you do. So it'll perhaps be an interesting exchange. Uh, and let me, uh, but let me start by stressing my uh, my high respect for the people of China. It grew during several visits to the country, and I I uh, was honored to represent a lot of Canadians of origin in China in Parliament for 27 years. And uh, let me, uh, but but let me also note here something that diplomats, sonologists, uh, journalists, and business executives often forget. China is its peoples, its cultures, its history, far more than its unelected government. The criticisms many of it ha have within and beyond China are of its governance, not uh, of the people. I hope that's clear to everybody here. I'm sure it is. Uh, we do, I certainly acknowledge with admiration that the uh, economic policies of paramount leader Deng Xiaoping uh, uh, lifted um, hundreds of millions of Chinese families, allowed them to lift themselves uh, out of abject poverty through their own hard work and intelligence and enterprise and so on. Uh, but I, some of you will know, I'm sure, that the uh, that Deng's reforms uh, in 1978 and beyond came after virtually no reform, economic reforms from 1949 until until 1978. Um, the world's democrats, including our own national government, civil society institutions, and businesses, should of course engage. Sorry, yes, <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> accurately, actively with the, the new Xi government uh, and uh, the broadest possible range of citizens across China despite the difficulties were cre created by its governance model. And the intensified crackdown on uh, online expression of opinion, which I believe probably my colleagues will talk about in the last year. Democracy with very ch Chinese features is probably a lot closer than many people think. How many experts, for example, anticipated the fall of the European totalitarianism? Uh, I can remember friends telling me that the wall would stay up for 200 years, not long before it fell, or the Arab Spring more recently. No one on the democratic side should forget that in this engagement that the values we represent are universal ones, including dignity for all, the rule of law, multi-party democracy, corporate social responsibility, and the need for people everywhere to have access to good jobs. Any discussion of governance in Beijing today must unfortunately start with Mao, because the founder remains the over, overarching icon of the party mm -hmm. state. Uh, Jung Chang and John Holliday and their comprehensive biography, Mao, The Unknown Story. How many of you have read The Unknown Story? I'd be curious to know. So not too many, OK? Um, by saying, quote, today, I think this was in 2005 they wrote this, Mao's portrait and corpse still dominate Tiananmen Square in the heart of the Chinese capital. The current communist regime declares itself to be Mao's heir and fiercely perpetuates the myth of Mao, close quote. Virtually all independent historians today include him with Stalin and Hitler as the three worst mass murderers of the uh, 20th century. Chang Holiday note, quote, in all, well over 70 million Chinese perished under Mao's rule in peacetime. I would like to say a word about uh, a hero, personal hero of mine, Gao Zhishang. I'm sure many of you know that uh, he has been, uh, he was actually born in a cave. His family was so poor, he didn't go to, I believe, university or to law school, but he managed to pass the bar exams. Uh, I don't know how he managed to pass them, but he did. He's a, he's a brilliant individual. He was, found to be, uh, he was found to be one of the 10 best lawyers in China by their Ministry of Justice. They took that away later on. but. Um, he defended people, evicted farmers, the disabled community, all kinds of people who were unrepresented. But he, at, at one point, began to defend Falun Gong, and the system came down on him like a ton of bricks. Um, his wife was attacked. His license was taken away. He was, he was uh, denied 
opportunity to earn an inc income. When he uh, responded in the nonviolent tradition of Gandhi by going on nationwide hunger strike, uh, uh, he, he really he began to suffer. One of his articles, he described more than 50 days of torture in prison. In January 2009, his wife, Geng He, and their two children escaped, uh, and they now live in California. He, uh, he remains in prison. Uh, it's difficult for many of us outside China to understand that trials there are mere theaters. My, uh, my f good friend uh, Clive Ansley practiced law in Shanghai for 13 years. He did about 300 cases. He, um, he uh, explains the reality of what happened to Gao, Nobel Peace Prize laureate Lu Xiaobo, and many others by observing, quote, there's a current saying amongst Chinese lawyers and judges who truly believe in the rule of law. This saying, familiar throughout all legal circles in China, vividly illustrates the futility of attempting to assist China in improving its legal system by training judges. The saying is this, those who hear the case do not make the judgment, those who make the judgment have not heard the case. Nothing which has transpired in the courtroom has any impact on the judgment. In effect, he says, the, a group of judges meet on a Wednesday morning and decide that these cases will come up in the following week. The decision in this case will be that, the penalty will be that. So the man or woman who sits on the bench looking like they're hearing the evidence simply get up and read the decision that's been made by a group of their colleagues in a meeting on a Wednesday morning or something. That's not the rule of law. Let me, uh, since you're all influential residents of this country, I'm assured, to urge your members of parliament to join the growing world consensus that maximum pressure should be applied now on the Xi government to end the pillaging of Falun Gong organs for large-scale large scale commercial trafficking purposes. Mm -hmm. David Matus and I concluded that 41,500 organs from Falun Gong prisoners of conscience were trafficked in the years between 2001 and 2005, six. This appalling commerce continues today, although I hope, uh, hope occurs that the recent promises to end the seizure of prisoner organs, including one presumes those from Falun Gong, uh, for trafficking will end. Um, in the 2012 book, State Organs, uh, writer-researcher Ethan Gutman estimates that 65,000 Falun Gong were killed for their organs during the years 2000 to 2008. Uh, that they were selected from about 1.2 million of them he, Gutman estimates were interned in Canada's force in China's Canada's China's forced labor system, as with the camps created by Hitler's Germany and Stalin's Russia, on which the ones across China are based, created by Mao in the 50s. A police signature alone remains sufficient to commit anyone to, for up to four years in these camps. No charges, no lawyers, no appeals. 2001, a U.S. government report estimated that at least half of the inmates in the 300 and 40 such camps in the country were Falun Gong. Leninist governance and anything is permitted economics, of course, allows organ trafficking to continue in, in China. The recent Hangzhou de Declaration is a step in a better direction. It was actually at the end of October. But only 40 doctors signed it, leaving 129 transplant hospitals and all of the military hospitals uh, seemingly unaffected. Matus and I David Matus and I visited about a dozen countries to interview Falun Gong, who managed to leave both the camps and the country. They told us of working in appalling conditions for up to 16 hours daily, with uh, no pay and little food, crowded sleeping conditions, and torture. Inmates made a range of export products, including Christmas decorations, chopsticks, of course, and, uh, and garments, as subcontractors to multinational companies. This constitutes, of course, both corporate irresponsibility and a violation of WTO rules. It calls for an effective response by all trading partners of China. It seems to me that our government should ban forced labor exports by enacting legislation which places an onus on importers in each country to prove their goods are not made in effect by slaves. The U.S. has an agreement, but they just don't bother to enforce it so that goods flood into the U.S. that are made in these forced labor camps. I'd like to go very briefly through a bit of how am I doing for time? Oh, you're fine. A bit of evidence that led us to our uh, very grave conclusion. 
Investigators made calls to hospitals, detention centers, and other facilities across China, claiming to be relatives of patients needing transplants and asking if the hospitals had organs of Falun Gong. We obtained tapes and we had independent interpreters telling us the translations were accurate. And, uh, and we have them on our website. If you want to just go to uh, David, uh, Google David Kilgore, you'll be able to get the, our report. It's available in 18 languages. Falun Gong practitioners who were detained and later got out of China testified that they were systematically blood tested and organ examined while in detention in these camps across China. The blood testing and the organ examination could not have been for their health, as they say, because they were regularly tortured. But it would have been necessary for organ transplants and for building a bank of live donors. In a few cases, family members of practitioners were able to see the mutilated bodies of their loved ones between the death and cremation, this is a terrible subject to be talking about at breakfast time, organs had been removed. We talked, for example, to the ex-wife of a surgeon who told us that he had removed the corneas from the eyes of 2,000 Falun Gong practitioners between 2001 and 2003. Um, uh, he was paid the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of US dollars for doing this. After the, he removed the corneas from these poor victims, their bodies were taken into other operating rooms and the rest of their organs were removed and their bodies were, were cremated. Finally, there is no other explanation for the transplant numbers, uh, numbers than sourcing from Falun Gong. China uh, is, is the second largest country in the world after the US for transplantation, but in, in, yet until 2010, China did not have a, de a deceased donation system. And even today, the system produces donations that are statistically insignificant. It's something like 230 donations a year, last time I looked. The living donor sources are limited in law to relatives of donors and are officially discouraged because live donors often suffer health complications, of course, after giving up an organ. The number of prison, prisoners sentenced to death and executed that would be necessary to supply the value of transplants in China is far greater than even the most exaggerated death penalty statistics and estimates in the tens of thousands. Uh, moreover, in recent years, death penalty volumes have fortunately gone down, but transplant volumes, except for a, a short blip in one year, have remained constant. <coughs> it's encouraging that the Spanish courts have recently issued arrest warrants for five former party state officials, including former President Jiang Zemin, who, by the way, he's the one who started the persecution of Falun Gong in, in uh, April of, two th of 1999, for human rights abuses in Tibet. I hope that eventually all of the doctors and people involved in this organ harvesting will, be, uh, will face the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Humanity. A word about the economy of, of, uh, uh, of China, because I know that's something that, in that interests all of us. Uh, a Canadian Jonathan Manthorpe observed a couple of years ago, quote, uh, he calls it a Ponzi scheme in China. Quote, a local government without a functioning system for raising tax revenue and riddled with corruption sells development land to garner cash, first getting rid of the farmers living on the land. And this being China, the municipality has the power to instruct banks to lend the development company the money for the sale. So the local government gets its cash, the municip municipally owned company gets to build a speculative residential complex and all seems well. I happened to note after I read this in the Financial Times that, uh, that uh, in a coastal city, luxury apartments were being uh, built for as much as 70,000 won. It's about $11,000 a square meter. And that's more expensive even than here in uh, Oslo, I understand. Which is about twice the annual income of the average resident. To finance a 150 square meter apartment in the building would consume every penny of a typical resident's income for 350 years. Uh, I'll skip through some of this. Uh, uh, just a word about state capitalism, as pointed out by The Economist. Uh, I, th I found this of interesting. Two key points. State capitalism fuses the power of government with capitalism through such mechanisms as listing government-owned companies on international stock markets. The Chinese party state is the largest shareholder in the country's 150 largest companies and directs thousands of others. The heads of the 50 or so leading companies have a red machine on their desks providing a link to the party's high command. It also has cells in most companies in the private sector. Transparency International ranks China 75th on its perceived corruption index for 2011. 
The Economist quotes a central bank of China estimate that between the mid-90s and 2008, some 16 to 18,000 Chinese officials and executives of state-owned companies, quote, made off with a total of $123 billion, about $6 million each. Concludes by turning companies into organs of the government, state capitalism simultaneously concentrate power and corrupts it. That's The Economist. Uh, uh, former Premier Wen Jiabo has also noted that, quote, the reform in China has come to a critical stage. Without the success of political structure reform, it's impossible for us to uh, fully uh, institute economic structure, structural reform. Um, I'm going to skip through some of this. I, I guess I, I'd ask the question, and maybe you do too, is why is it that our governments, investors, and businesses in Norway and elsewhere in Canada why, ask them why they're supporting the violation of so many universal values in, in order to increase trade and investment with China. For years, this has resulted mostly in national jobs being outsourced to China. The Americans estimate that about 20 million jobs in the United States have moved to China over the last 15 or 20 years. Canada is, isn't quite that bad. I wonder how Norway is. Are the rest of us so focused on access to inexpensive consumer goods that we ignore the human, social, and natural environment costs paid by many Chinese nationals to produce them. Oh, some good news. Not much good news in this talk. In mid-January 2013, Walmart pledged to hire more than 100,000 American veterans and boost its sourcing from domestic suppliers. The retailer announced a three-part plan to help jumpstart the American economy, which includes spending $50 billion to buy more American-made goods over the next 10 years and and helping its part-time workers move into full-time positions. How about Canadian, Norwegian companies, again, recognizing that companies with good manufacturing and other jobs are their best customers? Peter Navarro, the professor at the University of California with a PhD in economics from Harvard, argues convincingly that consumer markets worldwide have been conquered by China largely through cheating. Navarro has proposals to ensure that trade becomes fair, such things as defining currency manipulation as an illegal export subsidy and adding it to other subsidies when calculating anti-dumping and countervail. Respect intellectual property, adopting and enforcing health, safety, and environmental regulations. He had this ban the use of forced labor, I'm glad to say, is one of them. Um, I guess I'm at the last part of this. Um, and so I'd, I'd simply end by saying that the Chinese people want the same things as the rest of us, respect for all, education, safety, and security, good jobs, the rule of law, democratic and accountable governance, and a sustainable natural environment. If the party state ends its systematic and gross violations of human rights at home, especially in the respect of Falun Gong practitioners, uh, and begins to treat its trade partners in a transparent and equitable way, the new century can bring harmony and coherence for China and the world. It seems to me the first step in a better direction is to end organ pillaging now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Perfect timing. Mr. Egenas. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, David. Very interesting talk. Uh, Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Sivita, for inviting me. What I'll try to do is uh, to give us sort of more of an overview of um, Amnesty International's view of the, the general human rights situation in, in China. But um, inspired by the invitation, uh, uh, quoting this enormous security apparatus in China, I found a, an article on BBC that I thought I would start with just to sort of set the tone uh, and this is an analysis, talks about an analysis from a, what they call a investigative journalism group called ProPublica, based in the US, who had logged 100 users of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Sina Weibo, which is, and anybody who knows Chinese, I just tell you right now, any Chinese words, I just excuse my pronunciation, <laughs> just sort of from the onset, definitely not one of my stronger points. So Sina Weibo, which is a, a Chinese Twitter. Uh, this group had logged 100 users who had had um, tweets, or Sina Weibo, um, <clears throat> taken down by authorities previously. Uh, and they logged them over two weeks, and 527 of their posts had been taken down. 
And it's interesting to, uh, to see what was taken down. Uh, there was a picture of a yawning politician. <clears throat> there were pictures of known dissidents. Um, and there were archive shots of the Korean War. These are just some examples. There were, of course, other stuff. But it shows that they really follow everything. And uh, particularly, of course, these people were probably known for being uh, slightly dissident. OK, so David has told us uh, quite a lot and, and focused on, on the organ harvest of, of um, particularly Falun Gong uh, followers. Of course, the organ harvest has also been um, other people. Other people who have been sentenced to death and executed have also had their, their organs harvested. Um, but I thought I would start my talk and base it around particularly one, but there have been, there's been quite a lot of news recently about uh, the third plenary and some reforms that have been suggested or decided, I guess we could say, uh, during this third plenary. Um, on the death penalty, we have been told that they will narrow the scope. There will be fewer crimes that could be punished with deaths without being given any details on that yet. And that seems to be a continuation of a slightly, and I underline slightly, positive trend as far as, as the death penalty is concerned in China. China is, although we don't know the numbers because they, they keep them as a state secret, is by far uh, the worst or the largest or the most adamant uh, executioner in the world. 80, 90 percent of all executions in the world. I mean, I'm now talking about sort of government sanctioned after a, a condemnation to death uh, are carried out in China. Um, we assume without knowing that after a few years back when all death sentences had to go by uh, the Supreme Court that the numbers have come down significantly, but we, we don't like to speculate, but some do, and that three to 4,000 people are executed in China every year is you know, a very, very minimal number. Some would say it's a lot more, others would say it's around that number, and that it has come down from definitely a double-digit number uh, a few years back. Um, we believe it is significant and we demand over and over again that the Chinese actually come out with the statistics. It doesn't sound like a very sexy demand from a, an activist human rights organization, tell us how many people you execute every year. Um, but one of the reasons for this is there is already a, definitely in, in, in more sort of educated uh, strata and academia and so on, there is a discussion around the death penalty. And although one assumes, and there are some polls, um, not ne necessarily national polls, but polls indicating that more than 90% of the Chinese population will support the death penalty, there are also polls and examples of polls uh, where a large, sometimes even close to majority of those asked are critical to the amount of uh, crimes that are punishable by death and the numbers of executions. And we believe that if uh, we are going to make a dent in the death penalty um, in China, we need a popular discussion. And, and, and if the numbers come out, and this, I think this is one of the reasons the numbers are kept secret, if the numbers came out, then you might have a discussion uh, beyond very closed circles in universities and so on. But so there is a, I always try to say that something is positive. There is a positive uh, trend, it seems, although still way too many people are sentenced to death and and executed. The other area that, where, that, has been, that has very strong human rights connections is the one-child policy, where now there will be, it will be less strict. And I might, be, I might not know all the details, but what I've at least read is that if, a couple, if one is a single child in a couple, then you, might, then you will be allowed to have more than one, one child. Amnesty International doesn't have a view on the, the one-child policy in itself. But we know that it has led to a lot of human rights violations, such as forced abortions, uh, torture of other kinds, and, and so on and so forth. So in that sense, uh, a, a liberalization, if you wish, is also good news for us. But, but the area where we really have been uh, involved, the third area where, <clears throat> where uh, uh, positive changes has been, has been um, decided is in what is called the re-education through labor camps. This is what, what David referred to, these camps where you can be placed for uh, up until four years, 
just based on the on the signature of a medium ranking police officer uh, that has been used heavily in the oppression of all kinds of dissidents or religious minorities or ethnic minorities or anybody somebody you don't like or you know and, and hundreds of thousands of people have, have been and are uh, are in these camps and on the face of it and to some extent also substantially this is uh, a positive step forward for human rights. But, and this is where I'm not so positive, uh, China already, or the authorities already have in place um, alternatives to make sure that if they want to put people in prison without a due process of law, uh, they can do it. And there is a whole list. <clears throat> One thing we've seen already happening is that a few of these RTLs, which is the re-education through labor, so bear with me, the, the, uh, the abbreviation RTL, have already been changed into forced drug uh, addic addiction combating camps. And we know, we can document that both dissidents, Falun Gong practitioners, and others have been placed in these camps as if they were drug addicted. And it's basically this, well, actually it's worse than some of the RTL camps. Uh, the regime is worse, the, the treatment of the people there is worse, and so on. So that's one way of getting rid of the RTLs, but still having a system where you can just place people without any kind of, of, of sentence in any kind of, <coughs> any kind of court. Then <coughs> they have also introduced recently, well, last year, uh, in their criminal law, what is called black jails in the sense that the police can place people without any kind of court decision in unofficial houses of detention, hostels, hotels, private homes. Um, and they don't even have to tell their families that where they are and that they have arrested them. This is now written in law and it is used particularly against people who are practicing a very, very old Chinese tradition of going to Beijing and complaining if you're not being treated properly in your local area. And it seems as if it's now almost systematic that if you have a more interesting or strong claim that you want to bring to Beijing, you end up in one of these black prisons for longer or shorter, and then you're sent back to the authorities that you were in Beijing to, to, uh, to, to uh, complain about. <clears throat> Once again, there is no, no due process, no, no law, no judge, nothing. It's just a policeman putting you in there. Then we have, and we've seen um, more use of this, um, what is popularly called uh, forced brainwashing. And this is definitely used on, on religious, religious minorities um, where people, it's called something like legal training something, uh, where people once again are, are force, forcedly placed and forced over time to renounce their belief, for instance, Falun Gong, that you know, I'm no longer, and I promise that I will never ever again practice Falun Gong. So this is a, another place one can, one can use. And then we have seen, and this is also significant and, and interesting, and, and also goes to what David said about the courts. We are seeing a documented rise in criminal charges against all kinds of um, perceived dissidents or I mean, it's, it's journalists, it's, it's lawyers, it's hu human rights activists, it's anti-corruption activists, it's Falun Gong followers uh, that are actually brought to court and sentenced, and we're seeing a rise in long sentences. I, I remember when we, when we spoke about uh, Liu Xiaobo just two, three years ago, we said that his 11 years sentence was in many ways, um, uh, it, was, it was longer than normal. Now we are seeing 10, 15, but these kinds of sentences coming in on a regular basis uh, against people who have raised their voices uh, against the Chinese uh, authorities and the system. And there is definitely a crackdown going on. And it, it started before the new, now I've, I've even been sent the name of the new president in sort of sound language <laughs> by my colleague, <laughs> Xi Jinping. <laughs> I have such good colleagues. Don't make a fool of yourself. Say it this way. <laughs> anyway, uh, has strengthened it. And people say when a new leader comes in, he has to sort of 
assert his power and so on, but we're definitely seeing a crackdown on any kind of, of dissidence. And I think it's very interesting and, and probably a very sad uh, sign of the times that this uh, relatively new group called the, the Citizens Movement, uh, that is, their demands are basically, could we please follow our constitutional laws? Uh, I think now 16 of them <clears throat> are arrested, and I don't think any of them have had their sentences yet, but people are, ex they have been, first of all, they were detained without, without being charged, then they were put in house arrest, some of them, then they've, a lot of them have now been formally arrested and charged with different kinds of crimes. Um, and it's, I think it's indicative of how, and I'm actually going to stop soon, so I'll be way shorter than 15 minutes. I think what we are seeing, um, and this might be interesting for those of you who are more China experts than I am, a very, very scared government. A government that is aware of the fact that it does not have any legitimacy. A government that sees that more and more, particularly on the internet, but also in physical gatherings on streets and, and uh, elsewhere, there is discontent and is going way beyond the sort of educated intellectual uh, groups that they have allowed to be, um, to some extent, to be, uh, to, to disagree with, with the governments. Um, I think particularly, and this is probably why this new citizen movement has been cracked down on, on recently, is because they took up the corruption question. They, they made a demand that all officials should declare their financial statuses. That's when we saw them started to get more arrested. Uh, the citizen movement is very cool, by the way. It's almost like a civita breakfast. They, they meet once a month and discuss political issues. And sometimes out of that, there is a petition or a demonstration or, or, or a demand. And, and one of these was you know, that officials should declare their, their financial status. And, and that's when we saw them getting cracked down, uh, the crackdown starting. So, I mean, you're almost obliged in Norway. Uh, and I think it's... I, I, consciously didn't do it. You're almost obliged to start anything you say about China to talk about the fantastic economic development and how it has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and, and so on and so forth, which is of course true, but I say it at the end rather than at the beginning. Uh, uh, and, and to some extent, uh, that whole discourse um, overshadows the fact that there is still widespread, ongoing, very targeted, quite, not intelligent, but, but smarter than, of course, the cultural revolution kind of human rights violations going on all the time and constantly. And of course, Norwegian businessmen and women who go there will not, it's not like it, you walk out and you have a camera and you'll see somebody be arrested or beaten up by the police. It's not that kind of brutality that goes on everywhere all the time but it is definitely a kind of brutality where thousands of people are in prison that shouldn't be there. And when they're there, they're ill-treated. Uh, they have no um, fair trial before they go there. Oh, I spent my 15 minutes. Um, and it is, <clears throat> every, and, and, and every positive development you see in law or even in practice is always countered by one thing, and this is, almost so political that I, as an amnesty person I shouldn't say it, but I will anyway. You will always find that anything that in any way could threaten the power of the party will be illegal. So you can open up in a lot of, or they can open up in some areas, but it will never ever be something that would actually challenge the power of the Communist Party. And that is the the, sort of the main aim of everything that is done. And when something is opened up, I think very often, like the RTLs, it is because there is a popular, a growing popular discontent. There have been a lot of scandals from the RTLs that have reached the internet and so on. And I think that is the main reason. In addition to, of course, and I, I, I don't under, underestimate that international pressure, but I think really when it started to, to shift was because they were outrages of people having died after torture, um, some scandals of, of that came out about the actual conditions within some of the camps and so on. I'll stop there and I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our last presenter, Mr. Torben Fadevik.
Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> China is always on my mind. <laughs> Even this morning, chilly morning in November. I began traveling to China in the 1970s, and it was quite a, an experience, I can tell you. And I have been to that country many times since then. I have witnessed uh, big changes for the better and the worse. Chinese economy has certainly improved, but progress has come to a very steep price. We may say that the Chinese, uh, they have got more of everything, more food, more cars, more shopping centers, um, even Starbucks these days, more millionaires and more billionaires, and more pollution, more lung cancer, and more corruption. However, the political system is much the same as before. China is still ruled by one party, and uh, no opposition is allowed. The recent Central Committee meeting in Beijing ended with a promise to overhaul the administrative and financial systems, but as far as we can see, there are no real plans for political reform. Meanwhile, many problems in the field of human rights remain unsolved. In the debate about human rights in China, you will hear quite many strange arguments, both in China and in the West. One common argument goes like this. China is an old civilization which must, must be allowed to follow its own rules. So why don't we hear the same argument in a discussion about Syria, Iran, and maybe North Korea? It is certainly true that China has a long and complicated history. And, of course, we cannot expect such a country to change overnight. Nor do we demand that. What we can expect is a gradual introduction of democratic rule over time. The Chinese leaders keep saying that the people isn't ripe for such a change. But in my opinion, the real problem is not the people. The problem is the Chinese leaders themselves. Olof Palme, uh, once upon a time former prime minister of Sweden, said that any change, any change requires political will. If you don't have that will, change will never come. Le the leaders in Beijing doesn't have that will, so they want to keep the ossified one-party system as long as possible. Many problems, uh, man, many, many countries in today's world, they have a very complicated past. China is not the only one. Yet, many of those countries have been able to shake off their feudal systems. Japan is a very good example. South Korea is another one. These days, promising developments are taking place in Burma. Presidentials, uh, presidential elections are scheduled for 2015, and the winner may be Aung San Suu Kyi. Are the Burmese better educated than the Chinese? I don't think so. Are the Indian people better educated than Chinese? Absolutely not. I'm not saying this because I'm suffering from the illusion that changing China is easy. I just want to counter the widespread myth that China isn't suited for change. Another common argument in the China debate in favor of keeping the present system are the impressive, impressive economic gains the last uh, 35 years or so, yes, they are impressive. But that should not prevent us from confronting the Chinese leaders whenever fundamental human rights are trampled upon. Countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran have also witnessed rapid economic development in the same period. Yet many problems in the human rights field persist. Would you really give these countries a free ride 
on human rights because of their economic gains? I don't think so. The Chinese people is one-fifth of mankind, which means that the development in China affects all of us. You may say that you don't care about politics in Liechtenstein or maybe in San Marino, and I admit that I am not very much interested in these countries either. But China is a very different case. As the most populous country in the world uh, enters the global stage, we have to remind the Chinese leaders that what they do and what they don't do have wider implications. Unfortunately, today's leaders in China continue to assert that human rights problems is an internal one in China, and it isn't. As the, the leader of the Norwegian uh, Nobel Committee said in his Liu Xiaobo speech in 2010, China's new status entails increased responsibility. China must be prepared for criticism and regard it as positive, as an opportunity for improvement. This is very important, I think, and I would like to add that China never will be accepted as a great civilized power unless it tolerates political criticism from its own people and from abroad. For the time being, I am not allowed to visit China, and this is one of many signs of the times. The Chinese leaders are not satisfied with censoring its own people. They want to extend, extend the range of intimidation to foreign press people, academics, writers, politicians, and even business people. By denying them visa, the Beijing leaders are sending a warning signal. Do not criticize us. Be careful. Censor yourself. Here in our country, a former prime minister has been denied visa to China. The Tibetans living in Norway are a special group of people worthy of attention. They want to visit their relatives in Tibet, but many of them are applying for a visa in vain. Probably they have been too outspoken or taken part in a political demonstration, I don't know. But these things are permitted by law in Norway, but it is forbidden in China. Also, foreign journalists posted in China find themselves under increasing pressure. They are followed closely and sometimes physically attacked by the police. The Foreign Correspondents Club in Beijing is not a legal organization since it has resisted demands to work within the limits of the Communist Party. Still, the FCC is trying to do its best to protect, to protect its members and defend the principle of freedom of information. Unfortunately, many Norwegians and Westerners are already bowing to China. They want to be on good terms with the big country in the East for several reasons. They want to visit China for journalistic purposes, for studying, for academic research or business. Too often I don't like what I see. In our everyday life, self-censorship is necessary. But this kind of self-censorship runs contrary to my principles. For me, as a writer and as an intellectual, the right to free expression is much more important than visiting China. So, I am staying here and traveling, meanwhile, to other countries in Asia. You can hardly open a newspaper these days without reading advice from business people and others calling for more cooperation with China. I am in favor of any meaningful cooperation with the Chinese, and I underline meaningful. China is too big to be ignored. In the years ahead, Norway and China has a lot to talk about, from human rights to the melting of the poles, 
but any cooperation must be based on certain principles, which involves the right to free expression and mutual criticism. Some are saying that China is so important for our economy that we have to be careful for that reason. Well, less than 2% of Norwegian export goes to China. Less than 10% of our import comes from China. Our most important trading partners are in Europe. And in spite of China's rise, it will be so in the foreseeable future. Now, three years ago, uh, three years after the controversial Nobel Committee decision, we, sh we should be able to draw some l lessons, I think. While promote the first one, while promoting trade and other exchanges with China, we should not become too dependent on that country. We should not place ourselves in a position where we, where we become vulnerable to pressure and in intimidation from Beijing. Second, we should do more to promote exchanges with other Asian countries. Even if we exclude China, Asia and the Pacific has almost 3 billion people. For a small country like Norway, this should be more than enough. A few days ago, I came back to Norway after six weeks in Asia. I have been to several countries and met Norwegian business people there and also diplomats. They all seem to agree that Norway should give more attention to Asian countries like Japan, South Korea, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand and others. If you have very many eggs, don't put all of them in the same basket. This is old wisdom, which is valid even today. Finally, I would like to uh, stress the importance of acquiring knowledge about China and Chinese culture. In 1974, I majored in Chinese history at the University of Oslo. The subject was overwhelmingly interesting and I still continue reading about China and its past. Many will argue that the present is even more interesting. Anyway, China and Chinese culture deserves our close attention. Likewise, the Chinese, not at least the Chinese leaders, should make serious efforts to understand the thinking and uh, political system in our part of the world. You will remember that a Chinese ambassador in Oslo three years ago spent a lot of time warning the Norwegian government against giving the Nobel Peace Prize to Liu Xiaobo. Well before the announcement came, he visited in person not only the foreign ministry here in Oslo, but every ministry in the government to convey his message. And as soon as the decision was announced, he and Beijing accused the Nobel Committee and the Norwegian government of being part of a vast imperialistic network led by Pentagon and the White House. In the ensuing uh, rounds of discussions, the Chinese chose to express themselves in a very rough language. I will use this occasion to, pray, to praise the Norwegian government, the former government, for its firm and principled attitude vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese. I suspect that the Chinese miscalculated from the very beginning, thinking that Norway, after all, would be a very easy match. However, it turned out differently and I hope that the present government will be just as firm and put principles before salmon and money. In the years ahead, the present political system in China will come under increasing pressure, and there are many reasons for that. One reason is the dissatisfaction uh, of the state of affairs within segments of the people, I would say large segments of the population, Key words in this respect are the deteriorating environment and the ever-present crisis.
corruption. Another reason is the fact that the Chinese are becoming more educated. Chairman Mao managed to, I would say, manipula manipulate his subjects because they were uneducated and uninformed. This is not the case anymore. And the third reason is the information revolution taking place everywhere. Although the Chinese leaders are trying to contain it by different measures, they are bound to lose this struggle against the new information technology. They may be able to win some smaller battles, but not the big one. And this is because new technology is always much smarter than dictatorial leaders. And this is why the present leadership should start preparing for a change in the political setup of the country, step by step and in a planned way. For some time, there has been much discussion about the possibility of a soft landing in China, but this discussion has been related to economy and economy only. The need for a soft political landing is equally important. Thank you very much for your kind attention.